Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar. Um, I'm Rike Kiergegaard, Program Specialist on HIV AIDS at the UNICEF headquarters in New York. And we're really delighted to be co-hosting a three-day webinar series from the Pediatric Adolescent Treatment Africa, or the PATSA Regional Summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, as part of UNICEF's Learning Collaborative on Children, HIV and AIDS which seeks to use learnings really from the front lines, such as here, to shape policy and programs for an improved global HIV response. PATSA is an action network of health service providers and health facilities that are working on pediatric and adolescent HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. And at the moment, we're broadcasting live from the summit, which is taking place on the 16th through to the 18th of October. The summit this year is called Ready Together, integrating HIV and sexual and reproductive health and rights through clinic community collaboration. So this summit is really about learning from each other on the ground through highlighting the challenges, uh, the best practices and lessons learned in integrating HIV testing, treatment and care with sexual and reproductive health and rights services for adolescents living with or at risk of HIV. The theme for today is ready to integrate HIV and SRHR services. And we're very excited to be here to share a selection of some of the presentations, uh, the findings and the practices that we have learned about today at the summit so far. So today we have three speakers with us. We have Alice Armstrong from UNICEF's Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office. We have Violet Nabatsa from Mild May Uganda Hospital. And then finally, we have Pumesa Runei from MSF in South Africa. These three presentations will take around 45 minutes and will be followed by around 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, but before we get started with the webinar, I would like to say a few words about the format. Um, first of all, if you have any trouble hearing or you have other technical issues, please do send us a message via the chat box and we will try to support you as much as we can. But before writing us, you can try to log out and log in again, restart your laptop and check your audio settings. Please do keep your mics on mute to avoid any background noise. Um, and then type in any questions you may have at any time using the chat feature. So you can start sending questions as soon as they occur to you, but we will not be taking them until the Q&A period. Um, and a little note on the Zoom webinar format is that you can send a question either to all panelists, um, which are all the speakers, or to all panelists and attendees. So please do use the second option so that everyone can see the question if you wish. Finally, uh, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and all the materials will be made available online after the webinar on childrenandaids.org. So please do also help share this recording with any of your colleagues that were not able to join us today. So without further ado, I'll um, introduce our first speaker. Alice Armstrong is an HIV specialist on adolescence at the UNICEF Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office in Nairobi. She has over a decade of experience in adolescent health and HIV policy and programming, working both at country and at global levels. She's trained as a specialist nurse in HIV and SRH, so she's worked with adolescents in diverse clinical settings. For the past 10 years, she has advocated for adolescent health and rights internationally, and she's made significant contributions to adolescent health policies, trainings, and tools, um, working with the Global Fund, as well as community-based groups and international NGOs. Alice is passionate about meaningful engagement of adolescents, and she's particularly committed to working with and for adolescents that are living with and at high risk of HIV. So Alice, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rike. Um, wonderful to be joining this webinar today. Actually, on behalf of um, my colleague, Mariam, who's the Chief of Health and Nutrition at our South African Country Office, uh, she presented this presentation this morning and has asked me to step in for her this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much for having me and great to see so many familiar names on the participant list for the presentation. So my job today is really to give you a regional update um, on adolescents and HIV within Eastern Southern Africa. And a look at uh, progress, and we're also going to have a look at what priority actions need to be taken. Next slide. Great. 
So the overall outline, I'm going to start off with where we are heading. What goals are we really trying to achieve? We'll then move on to what progress have we seen so far for adolescents living with HIV in this region? And then we'll move, move to what will it take? Um, and we'll try to look at what are some of the priority actions that are required for us to scale up services to reach all adolescents living with HIV. Next slide, please. So in terms of our targets, we have super fast track targets. These are very ambitious targets that have been set out within the three freeze agenda. Uh, these go beyond the 1990s. We're really we're wanting to see nearly all, almost all of adolescents on ART. So 95% of adolescents living with ART by next year. Next slide. So how are we measuring up to these super fast track targets? What progress have we made for adolescents living with HIV? And um, so what I'm going to do now is just really go through and explore this progress and um, looking at along the cascade. So I'm going to look first at um, find and test, and I'm going to look at link, and then uh, treat and retain. And then finally, I've added in the additional key aspect of care and support. Great. Next slide. Thanks. Yep. Wonderful. So I wanted to start off with some of the, the progress that is good and exciting. We really are recognize the efforts of so many of us in this region. They've been working tirelessly and we have really come far um, along the way, even in the last five years. So now we understand adolescents more than we ever have had before. We understand more about the brain, the impact on their behaviors. We also are aware of their needs and also their requirements for tailored interventions. They're also in global health plans and, and policies. We have the accelerated action framework for adolescents as well as um, them in the, the global plan for, for children, adolescents and, and women. At country level, we have seen really strong political commitment and leadership um, with dedicated adolescent uh, staff at national level and inclusion of adolescents in key uh, national policies and even seeing tailored interventions for them. We've also seen incredible regional uh, initiatives and catalytic fundings, the Global Fund, uh, Catalytic Funds for Adolescent Girls and Young Women, DREAMS, Together for SRH, as funded by the, the Swedish. Um, we've also seen incredible efforts around data. Through the all-in assessments, um, we have been able to understand our adolescents and country level a lot more. And we've seen Kenya and Uganda really beating the rest of the region to have age disaggregated subnational data. And this is really being used to inform really targeted programming. We see an increased understanding of, of what it really is working, what interventions are working. So we've had the, the really new Jandiri trials. So it's a randomized control trial that looked at the effectiveness of peer cats, so community adolescent treatment supporters. Also recently at the Adolescent HIV Workshop, we had over 300 abstracts that were submitted. And finally, and but most importantly, we've seen really strong-led, youth-led advocacy, um, a growing number of youth networks at country level and also regional initiatives, um, such as the READY initiative that you have heard a lot about today at the PASA Summit. Next slide. So despite all these fantastic uh, achievements, um, unfortunately, we have not seen, we're still struggling to see the progress in terms of impact of these changes on adolescent outcomes. In terms of find a link with new infections, we continue to see the same gap between boys and girls with the overall flatlining of progress, um, particularly for adolescent girls. One thing to note is that we have a, a growing adolescent population and we're not seeing an increase, but still we are very far off um, our, our super fast track targets when it comes to new infections. Next slide, please. The ongoing high number of new infections is further compounded by a very low testing rate amongst adolescents. This means many adolescents don't know their HIV status and therefore are unable to get access to prevention, treatment, and care that they need. Data from 30 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa um, 
the percentage of adolescent boys 15 to 19 who have ever tested or received their result was low as 12%. It was 22% for adolescent girls. Next slide. Having knowledge and developing skills is an important enabler for adolescents and young people to make decisions about their health and well-being. When it comes to HIV and SRH knowledge, despite many years of advocacy and investment, we still have quite a long way to go. Data from country level DHS surveys indicates low and incorrect uh, knowledge about HIV prevention in our region. Only three Eastern Southern African countries, um, only in three Eastern Southern African countries do even half of young people have adequate HIV prevention knowledge. And this was, you know, answers to quite simple questions around transmission. Um, one of those countries, there's a study of uh, school students in Kenya, um, and it showed only 24% between 17, for 15 and 17 years had knowledge of contraception and then even less, only 15% knew where to access that contraception. Next slide. So for adolescents who have tested, what do we know about whether they are linked to this prevention and care services? Unfortunately, we don't have a very clear picture. Um, especially for um, HIV self-testing, we have seen good uptake for those over 16. Unfortunately, the yield has not been great and, and we don't really have a clear understanding of whether any of those who did tests were linked to services. From large multi-country multi cohort studies, you've seen that young people 15 to 24 do have higher rates of loss to follow up when compared to all other age groups. In some ways, it's not very surprising considering adolescents face complex barriers accessing services. They often feel healthy, they aren't concerned about uh, their healthcare, they lead, they lead busy lives with many competing priorities. They face consent requirements. They have to navigate really complex health systems. They're often far away from where they live and they don't have the, the resources uh, to access them or even to make it to the services. And once they get there, they often face with poor quality of services. Next slide. So when we look at data, so when we look at data um, for treat and retain, a good place to start off is with how many adolescents are living with HIV. Our region is home to the largest number of adolescents living with HIV in the world. It's over 1 million. And 59% of those adolescents in our region actually live in four countries, South Africa, Mozambique, Uganda, and Kenya. Next slide. When we look at data on adolescent AIDS-related deaths, we see we have seen some improvements, but we have seen limited progress since 2016. This does mean that um, adolescents living with HIV are not getting to access to the ART or the support that they need to remain in care and to adhere to their treatment. And three countries in our region account for almost half the AIDS-related deaths amongst adolescents living with HIV. Next slide. So when it comes to coverage of treatments and adolescents who are on ANT, unfortunately our regional data is not available. This is due to lack of age disaggregation. Um, but we do have some data from a recent study in the Lancet on South Africa, where these, these are the percentages of adolescents who were initiated ART, and you'll see that these are far less than our targets. Um, and, and these are percentages of the total registered adolescents within the facility. Uh, when we look at viral load depression, we face a similar pro problem with data. However, the, the, the FEAR studies, these are the population-based HIV impact assessment surveys, provide us some insight with multiple countries showing trends of low suppression rates among adolescents and young people. Next slide. So I also wanted to highlight the additional aspect of care for adolescents living with HIV. This is something that we can no longer ignore, and it's important that we start reporting on some of these outcomes. I wanna start off with mental health. We have seen emerging evidence from small studies, but these 
of confirming our concerns regarding mental health challenges for adolescents living with HIV and also the contribution that these challenges have on HIV and other health outcomes. Next slide. Similarly, for uh, sexual reproductive health, which is a key focus for the PACA Summit, we are seeing some notable trends. This data on the slide is from a systematic review of studies that were done in the African region on the sexual reproductive health needs and outcomes of adolescents living with HIV. Adolescents living with HIV are sexually active, and this aspect of care needs to be addressed. Between half and two thirds of adolescents reported um, having an older sexual partner um, at first sex, and it was also they also had um, they also reported reduced condom use. Adolescents also reported other high risky sex behaviors such as transactional sex and having sex for money or goods, which is then this finding was consistent across a number of studies. For contraception use, this was also reported to be low and even low when it came to dual protection. And additionally, a few studies highlighted uh, high rates of um, sexually transmitted infection. Next slide. We see further evidence of the unmet need for sexual reproductive health for adolescents in our region through our data on adolescent pregnancies. In five East and Southern African countries, for every 1,000 adolescent girls, we have over 130 births. For those pregnant girls who are living with HIV, we are seeing lower PMTCT service uptake and also higher rates of mother to child transmission when we compare these to older pregnant women. Next slide. Great. So, just to recap, we have ambitious targets. We've made some key progress in terms of policy, national commitment, advocacy, availability of data and evidence. But in terms of impact on the health outcomes of adolescents living with HIV, we still have a bit of a way to go. Through the next couple of days of the PADA uh, Summit and even on this webinar today, people will be sharing many interventions that are showing to be working. This too is also part of the progress. Um, I'm not gonna repeat those today as you'll hear them uh, in many of the other presentations across the three days. But I think it's important to really highlight that we need to be reaching all adolescents living with HIV. And that we, to do this, we need to be moving beyond our pilots and centralized services and moving towards scaling up for scaling up services for all adolescents living with HIV. Next slide, please. So UNICEF and, and partners are developing a framework that is going to support service delivery for children and adolescents. And this framework is going to be uh, further expanded by one of our headquarter colleagues, Shafiq, over the next coming days. So I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that. I just wanted, so in the next slide, I just wanted to, to highlight some of the aspects of going to scale. Yep. So what, what does it really take? Um, how do we move towards scale? UNICEF did a regional uh, review last week of ex last year of uh, experiences and programming for adolescents uh, living with HIV. And I just wanted to present some of the, the key considerations that were raised um, within that review. So this was uh, also through uh, focus groups and many key informant interviews with programs within in the region. So some of these key considerations for to get us to scale or what is gonna help us to, to reach that scale. So there is a need to strengthen the use of our data to inform our pro programs. So we've mentioned again and again, the need for age, sex and subnational disaggregated data. The fact that we need to make sure that the interventions that we are going to scale are working. Um, we also need to expand our understanding um, beyond some of the programmatic uh, uh, outcomes to look at clinical, but also some of the psychosocial and sexual reproductive health outcomes. And then we need to be using this data for advocacy and also for resource mobilization. We really need to galvanize the role of national programs. We can't get to scale without our governments. Um, facilitating coordination and partnership mechanisms is important, uh, including technical working groups also at 
district level, we need to ensure that interventions for adolescents living with HIV are incorporated in all the national plans and policies. But with these, we also have implementation plans. There's also a need to harness the expertise of many of the NGOs that have been implementing over the years really to support national programs in scale up. Next slide. Next one. Sorry, next slide. Great. We also need to be building the capacity of our implementers. And this is through standard national packages, operating tools, uh, training curriculums. Um, we need to be also making sure with the use of more and more peer providers, which is fantastic that we have clear defined roles and responsibilities with accountability, but also compensation. We also need to implement integrated supervision, mentorship and support mechanisms for our implementers. We need to also prioritize sustainability. Um, and we can do this by also championing the broader adolescent health agenda. HIV has a lot to contribute uh, to that understanding. And part of that is advocating for the inclusion of a scale up funding within the broader funding mechanisms that we have available to us as the global fund. To do this though, we need to have a good understanding of cost. Um, how much do these interventions cost? And um, we also need to be prioritizing some of the, the key elements within our interventions, which ones have the most impact and, and looking to see how those will look at scale and how much they will look, how much they will be at scale. Finally, we need new interventions and approaches, ones that take into consideration the diversity of all adolescents living with HIV. Um, and, and part of this is also including the role of um, digital technologies. I think overall it's important that we improve our operational efficiencies, but we also need to innovate and find new ways um, to be providing uh, particularly the care and support for adolescents living with HIV. So that's just a bit of a snapshot to some of the, the, um, the outcomes of that review and some of the recommendations in terms of moving towards a scale up of services. So next slide, very quickly, the last one, just some take home points that we wanted to leave you with, just two important reminders. So when you are designing and planning and adjusting your interventions, please always consider scale. What would this intervention work at scale? What steps do we need to take to get to scale? Also, we want you to love your data. <laughs> we want you to use it and learn from it. Uh, we need our data to inform what we do. We need to make sure that the programs that we're doing are actually impacting the outcomes of adolescents. So use, look at your data, use it, make, use it to inform the programs that you're doing. This data is also critical for our advocacy and our research mobilization. Without it, we will not see uh, critical progress needed for this important population in our region. So the last slide is just a thank you uh, to all of you for listening, but also to my UNICEF colleagues who um, helped to prepare this presentation and then also to Mariam who presented this morning. Thank you so much. Many thanks to you, Alice, for giving us this really uh, comprehensive overview of the situation for adolescents and HIV in the Eastern and Southern Africa region. Um, I think it's, it's really given us a great start to this webinar to discuss then the, the models that can be used, approaches that can reach adolescents and integrate services uh, better. So our next speaker uh, with us here is Violet Nabata from Malme, Uganda. Violet is a pediatrician currently working as a head of pediatric and adolescent services at Malme, Uganda Hospital. She offers technical support as a team leader, working with clinicians, counselors, social workers, and nurses. And she has five years of experience working with adolescents as a special group. So Violet, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am here on behalf of Maizme Uganda to take us through adolescent sexual and reproductive health rights as a one-stop shop experience for Miles May Uganda. And Miles May Uganda opened up in 1998 to strengthen pediatric HIV and AIDS service delivery in Uganda as a country. 
And um, this care was followed by adult care where adolescents were left out. Young children were growing into adolescence and later adulthood. So the gap was really evident that the children that were started with, we had to bring the adults on board that were taking care of them, but adolescents were not in the picture. Before 2007, we had the abstinence gospel, but adolescents were getting pregnant, meaning the gospel was not being taken to heart. Many were sexually active without protection against sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. Many of them feared disclosure of their status. They feared disclosure of sexual activity, and they also feared disclosure of pregnancy anyway. Then in 2009, we had a peer-led approach start to empower the young people living with HIV for sexual reproductive health rights. It started with training of health workers who are trained on delivery of adolescent services, and these were mainly the clinicians. But training was cascaded down to involve adolescent counselors, cognizant of the fact that adolescents are a special heterogeneous group that really required counseling that was specific to their group. And then further down, the cascade went to adolescent peer educators. And these educators are young people living with HIV. We know that peer educators are the bridge between the healthcare team as well as the adolescent that's what, that we are serving. So we felt we needed to have this team educated on how to handle adolescent care concerns and bring them up to the clinicians. The services that are offered are layered out according to age groups. We have age group 10 to 14 years who come into the clinic every Tuesday. And among the topics that we discussed with them include hygiene, academics, making choices, acceptable behavior in society, and expected changes in adolescence, among others. Then we have the age group 15 to 19 years who are taken through managing adolescence, career guidance, life skills, relationships, family planning and abortion, as well as entrepreneurship. And this group is seen every Thursday. Then we have the age 20 to 24 years who are taken through entrepreneurship, career guidance, relationships, and transitioning, as well as uh, sexual gender-based violence, among others. And these are seen every Friday of the clinic. Then we have other services, which include peer counseling by the peer educators, and the adolescents are involved in multiple age-appropriate peer support groups. We saw this fit because we could not just sit back and then have a whole array of topics given to every age group, but we thought out and picked out those that would be tailor-made for the individual age groups and shared them according to that for the benefit of the particular age group that day. We have a multidisciplinary team approach which includes a clinician, a social worker, a counselor, and a peer. And these are the people that are responsible for this adolescent when they come in. Sometimes we may have one adolescent having to visit all the four, but they all uh, reside in the same block. So it's easy for the adolescent to move from one room to another to receive the service that is required for the day. So the clinicians, does, uh, the clinicians do the clinical and other needs assessment. They use the reproductive health tool that is designed to pick up specific needs, and this is through probing and questioning. We then have the reproductive health staff who do registration, specific reproductive health counseling, service provision. They give out brochures and also um, do the condom dispensary fields. We also have the social workers who assist with empowerment. Uh, they assist with the social and economic empowerment as well, and education, which may be formal or in, term, in form of apprenticeship. Then we have the health education talks, which may be given by the peers, the counselors, or clinicians on general and specific topics as the clinic goes on. We have the peer-to-peer -peer talk or one-on-one, -on -one. and during this time, adolescent needs are picked up. We get peer attachments where we get contacts for peers, and then these are given to the different adolescents for easy sharing, uh, for ongoing support and counseling while through the clinic. Uh, the clinicians use a tool to collect some of the information in terms of uh, sexual reproductive health. And this tool picks out sexual activity, disclosure to the partners, condom use, other family planning methods. We also need to find out about status of the baby for those who have had 
babies. And we also pick information on cervical cancer screening in the past one year for the sexually active girls. Among the services that we offer, um, they include counseling and support on HIV prevention and sexual reproductive health. We have a call-in center for adolescents to talk to someone about health concerns. We also offer basic health screening and management of sexually transmitted infections. We offer family planning services, cervical cancer screening and breast examination. Uh, we also have the EMTCT service provided, adherence and positive prevention counseling services and consultations with various technical staff, including counselors, doctors, nurses, social workers, among others, as per the requirement of the adolescents that day. Uh, we have a few of uh, some results on selected parameters that we look at through the quarters. Uh, we handle a total number of adolescents, about 1,500. Viral suppression is at about 90 to 94 percent. Retention in care is at 98. Sexual activity ranges between 9 to 12 percent. Disclosure to the partner ranges between 65 to 80 percent and condom use at 62 to 78 percent and cervical cancer screening at two to four percent no program comes without a challenge so some of the challenges we face include stigma uh, balancing positive living and exploring sexuality is a real challenge for this age group we also have conflicting desires and expectations some of the caretakers may persuade pregnancy pregnant adolescent girls to have an abortion, sometimes choosing unsafe environments. And then there's interruption in services where school terms may interrupt peer-to-peer -peer follow up, especially for those adolescents living with HIV who have to spend time away at boarding school. So if there's a program between the peers, it's broken because the adolescent has to stay in school for about three months or more. But we also have factors for success which include integration of adolescent-friendly sexual and reproductive health services into routine HIV care, so that when someone comes in for HIV care, even their needs are serviced and it's just a one visit, they don't have to come back another day. We have a strong program focus on individual responsibility, disclosure, and building self-esteem. So this is what goes to the adolescent, so that we empower them to be able to take charge of their lives and control their reproductive health needs. Training of health workers in adolescent sexual reproductive health opened communication between adolescents and health workers. In that way, health workers are more receptive to the adolescents and the adolescents trust the health workers and are able to volunteer information concerning their sexual reproductive health needs. The peer-led approach led to increased referral and uptake of services. And we also have that one-stop, one-stop shop for all adolescent sexual and reproductive health services resulting in satisfied customers. The segmentation of groups by age, gender, and sexual activity status also assists so that the, the service that we give uh, is based on the group that we have. Education and counseling of caretakers of these adolescents. And we also do continuous needs assessment, which allows the program to adapt to meet the changing needs of the target population. Many thanks to Mild May Uganda for controlling the program and also to Pata for putting this summit up and everyone who has been very supportive in ensuring that we achieve success in terms of sexual and reproductive health for adolescents living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you very much, Violet. Um, it was a very interesting example and we could really see the results of just making it easy and providing services together catering to the very diverse needs um, of adolescents and young people living with HIV. So thank you once again. I will now introduce our last speaker, um, Pumesa Rune from MSF South Africa, uh, where she works as the Patient Support Health Promotion Officer. Pumesa has worked with adolescents and youth since 2005 in Kayelicha Township in South Africa, um, conducting trainings on youth care clubs and adolescents and youth-friendly health services at health facilities. Yes, thank you. Over to you. <laughs> Evening, everyone. Um, so my slide is not here. Thank you so much. 
And so um, today I'll be speaking to you about the community youth clubs um, that we rolled out in Kailicha from 2018. So here my slides just speaks to the problems of reaching HIV positive young people. While we know that facility youth clubs have shown good retention in care, but we know that also our facilities are congested. They don't have space for young people and young people they need to have their own space to be comfortable. So we came to the community models of care where we know that they will assist the facilities in decongesting the facility, appealing to young people, convenient and quick as well because they hate waiting for a long time. And here now, this slide shows that the provision of the SRHR services to young people is the key. And integrating the SRHR services with HIV services as well is also a key component. And that community youth club model of care that offers integrated SRHR services and HIV services, it works better for young people. We coming from Kailicha in Cape Town, South Africa, and we're working with a youth clinic um, that is in a city of Cape Town clinic. So the clinic offers termination of pregnancy. It offers the youth clubs in the facility. It offers community youth clubs as well. It also offers PrEP as a provision for the SRHR services. And so looking at who are we talking about? We're talking about the young people here. So they always have to be at the center. So in our building box, we made sure that we have a group of young people um, from 15 to 20. So we don't want to have a group that will have young people that will be more than 20, because we want them to be a group that can um, relate to each other, understand and know each other. And the ages we looked at as the age of 20 to 25. And we didn't want to mix a 16 year old with a 20 year old because their language is not the same. So these young people, in order for them to be in this club, they had to be in a facility club for more than two years. And then they can join in the community clubs. So they also get the art referral in the club, um, arterial support as well, and psychosocial care. So who's involved in this? So we need to have a nematode nurse who's going to run the clinical management, um, including PEP smear, family planning, STI screening and treatment, TB screening and treatment as well. And we also have a counselor who acts as a facilitator for these clubs. So the counselor's main role is to make sure that she prepares for the club. She checks the symptoms and she facilitates the sessions. So where do they meet? They meet in a community hall a space where the young people are agreed upon. So it's a space that they looked for and said, yes, this space is fine for us. And when do they meet? They meet bi-monthly because they don't want to meet every month. It gets too much for them. And also they don't want to meet after two months because it gets too much. They miss each other. So they need to meet um, bi-monthly. So this slide here, it shows the activities that happen during the club and after the club. So as I've mentioned that the, the counselor or the facilitator has a role to play and also the nurse has a role to play. So I'm not gonna go through this because I've spoke about them. And again, when you're running these sessions for the young people in the community, we divide them into three phases. So the phase one is an administration phase where we put everything down in the register of the club. Weight, symptom check, phone numbers. Well, if I talk about the phone numbers, it's something that changes all the time with young people. They always have different phones, different phone numbers. So maybe one will have two phones at the same time. So it's always good for us to make sure that we check if that number is still the same so that when we want to communicate with them, then we use the correct number. And then phase two, it's a phase where we will be running the session in the club. But before running a session, you start with an icebreaker where you warm them up and you make sure that you encourage everyone to participate in the discussion. So again, we go to phase three, then phase three, it's the last phase when the session is done, where they get their prepacked medication, they take um, condoms and lubricants, 
And then those who are going to have family planning, they also go to the nest to have family planning as well. And now with these sessions that I spoke about, they form part of the social support that we provide to the young people. So we have different topics. Um, we have about 12 topics in the guide that we've made. So part of those topics will be topics around sex and relationships, generals and expectations, violence within relationships, so and many others. So every time they come to a club session, they know that there's a topic that they're going to be talking about. So I'll make an example of a session where we run the violence within relationship one. So when you're running this as a facilitator, you do not have to be a teacher. You need to facilitate it and make them come up with the words, come up with the answers, make sure that they give you what is violence within relationships. Because young people, they know these things. And if you come and tell them about them, then they'll feel like you're teaching them things that they don't want to do. But if you let them talk about it, then it's easier. So we divide them into smaller groups so that in each group, they're able to speak. So because we don't want to just open it up for the whole group because some of them will be scared to speak, but when they're in smaller groups, then they're able to speak out. And you give them scenarios as well and questions to discuss. So some of the questions would be that you ask them um, to think about who has a power in those relationships and why. So when we talk about relationships with them in this session, we talk about boyfriend relationships, girlfriend relationships, parent relationships, neighbor relationships, friends relationships, and so on. So all types of relationships that they go into. And again, the other question will also be checking if they understand that who has power in balance in these relationships. And so if that person has power, um, they might take advantage of each other and they need to understand the different types of violence as well that happens within those relationships where verbal would be happening, physical will happen, sexual and economic abuse as well um, would be happening. So when we do this topic, we want to make sure that they get to understand what is violence um, within relationship. And at the end, we must then give them support and tell them where to go when these kinds of violence happens to them. And they should know that it is not healthy and you should seek support when you in one of this um, violence in the relationship. So now looking at the community clubs, um, we had to look at the viral conviction and the viral suppression. So we looked at 18 months period of these clubs. And then so out of 79 club members, and we had three that were transferred out, and so we were left with 76. But 65 of them, um, they, they completed their VARA load at 18 months. And out of the 65, again, we had 64. Um, that had suppressed viral, viral load. So they, I'm talking about like 86% of um, viral completion and 98% of viral suppression. So these are just the outcomes that we looked at um, when we looked at these community clubs. So out of it all, we had some lessons learned, um, things that we looked at and see that they can um, help others as well if they want to go with the community clubs. Like saying community clubs can provide integrated HIV care and SRHR services to youth. Like as I've mentioned earlier on that we do family planning within those um, community clubs. Pep smears are done, education sessions are done, condoms are distributed, STI and TV are also looked at when they're in these clubs. Also psychosocial support is a vital component of the SRHR services and some of it can be provided via youth club models. So if they're in a youth club, they can get um, these components. And also community youth clubs show non-inferior results to youth clubs as I've shown the outcomes in, in my last slide. So it shows that they can be in a facility, they can be in a community if there is someone who's always there with them, then the results will be good. But there's always challenges um, in running the community youth clubs, like including um, availability of transport, 
need for dedicatedness at each visit as well as good planning of the service. So we always say if you plan in advance, like three days before the club, then this would work better. But if you plan on the day of the club, you might then need transport and then there's no transport or the nurse had to have see other patients while there's a club happening. So, but then if you do it in time, then it will assist in making sure that this runs smoothly. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pumesa, for giving us another great example of how adolescents and young people's sexual reproductive needs can really be integrated into HIV treatment care, into youth clubs. Um, it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. And now um, the floor is open for Q&A. But before taking the questions I've been taking in, I have the honor of presenting Luan Hatane, the executive director of PATA, who would like just to share a few reflections on the first day so far. Oh, great. Well, it's, it's wonderful being with everyone. And of course, it's been a, a hugely busy day and still continues to be busy. <clears throat> but I think, yeah, we had a great start to the summit today. I mean, obviously, the first day today has really been focused on um, HIV and SIH uh, integration with a real sort of key message on, on young people's voices and choices. And the day started really with an overview on progress and priorities in, in integration with some difficult questions and conversations around whether and asking really, you know, are we really delivering? Um, obviously exploring some of the challenges and um, the barriers in terms of our structural operational realities in many of the facilities in being able to integrate services. Um, yeah, and actually at the moment and for the rest of the day, everyone is very busily involved in different skills building workshops and Africa cafes. Um, we're really from the front line. We have many um, partners and clinic partners and community-based partners who are really sharing their experience um, and sharing their models um, and also yeah, building some skills. I think at the moment um, they're all looking at counseling for choice, um, really with a big focus also on GPA, the great involvement of young people living with HIV. And some other people are involved in some case scenario discussions, um, really looking at the clinical management of young people on ART um, with integrated SRHR services. So yeah, I think it's been a, a good successful day. And I'm sure on day three, we'll be able to sort of have a better overview of things. And yeah, but thank you so much, Rika. Thank you, Luan. Okay, well now um, proceed with Q&A. Uh, we have a question from Jane Ferguson to Alice. She's saying you were um, reporting on the percentage of adolescents reporting HIV self-testing, but not HIV testing rates more generally. So she was wondering if you have any rates related to other HIV testing strategies. Hi there. Hi, Jane. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, there was a recent systematic review that was done uh, last year by Brian Zanononi. I think it's, we both know him, but I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong, um, where he had a look at um, low and middle income settings, um, different interventions in terms of, of uptake um, and yield for adolescents. Um, and they also looked at linkage. Unfortunately, we don't have much data for many types of uh, approaches for linkage to care for adolescents. We don't have that data available. Um, however, there were two, two studies that did highlight that the potential and for linkage, and those were ones that were um, doing index uh, testing, so in home-based index testing. Um, and then I also know from since that systematic review, there was another publication from EggPath uh, where they found that peer navigators were also helpful for, for linkage. One thing to note in the systematic review, it just highlights kind of uh, 
beyond the facility interventions. Um, so in terms of uh, facility entry points, um, we, I guess we need to be looking at programmatic data and reporting on that. That wasn't included in the systematic review. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thanks. Great. Yes, th there's another um, question related to that from Anya Sebastina Cho um, asking about HIV index testing, whether mm -hmm. you think that that would be a great strategy towards epidemic control in the Eastern and Southern Africa region. Yeah, so um, actually, it, it actually does, as to we would expect, um, the studies with index testing show higher rates of yield, which is what we will ex uh, what we would expect. Also, um, Uganda, I think some of our colleagues um, highlighted that before in the chat box as well. Um, they recently did some work on, on partner notification, and they age disaggregated that information um, for adolescents and for young people and showed that, you know, the, both the um, testing rate, so the uptake rate, and also the yield was, was quite high through that. So I think those are definitely um, aspects that need to be, to, to be looked at. But um, I can try find the link for that systematic review um, and post it on the chat box so people can and have a, have a look at that as well. Thank you. Um, then uh, we have a couple of questions to Violet. Um, it seems we have a, a very active group from UNICEF Kampala, so that is great to see. Um, so, Violet, a question to you. Do you think it's too late to start the transition at age 20, 24 years since it does take a little bit of time? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Now, we set out to have that group and it mostly covers those who have problems with transitioning, but as soon as our people reach 17 years old, we start the transition process. Now, we actually realize that some of them pick it up quite fast. And by the time they reach age 19, they are closing in on adolescence and are ready to move on. But then we retained the Friday for the 20 to 24. And this is specifically for those who have challenges transitioning. They are the ones we keep on as we continue counseling them and taking them through the process. But the key point here is we start preparing them for transition at 17. And averagely, it takes about two years to prepare one to complete the cascade of transitioning. So by the time they're close to 19 years, they are ready to transition, keeping just those who have failed to in time. And another question from UNICEF Kampala is at mid-May, do you also conduct um, psychosocial assessments? And if so, uh, do you use the HEADS assessment tool? And if yes, how often? Thank you very much for that question. Of course, um, the psychosocial component is very, very um, important, especially when we are dealing with adolescents because studies have come up with a proportion showing there's a lot of depression majorly happening with the adolescents and this impacts on their adherence to medication. So we do that assessment whenever we interface with an adolescent, but uh, specifically looking at the HEADS assessment, it is also done as part of the complete package that we give to the adolescents. So most of the time for the stable adolescents in terms of viral load, they come in once in three months. So at the time that they come in for that visit, we end up administering the heads assessment tool to be able to pick up their issues as adolescents. And then of course, for those that come in every month, at least we are aware that we should be able to do it um, once when they come in. And if there are any issues to pick on, it gives us the frequency with which we continue doing the assessment repeatedly. But uh, for those who are stable, we do the assessment once in three months when they come for their clinic visit. Thanks for the comprehensive answer. Um, I have another question from UNICEF Kampala, but I will direct it to Ellis and possibly also to you, Fumesa, <laughs> afterwards. Um, they are discussing the age for self-testing and assisted partner testing. Um, and the discussion is around 12 years uh, for the general HIV testing versus possibly 18 years for self-testing. So they're asking what the experience is of other countries. I'd like to ask Alice, um, what, do you, what is the experience in the region? And also Pumesa, if you have any experience from South Africa. Alice, please go ahead. Uh, 
Um, Alice? Do you want to All right. So for us, um, we also had, uh, we've been doing the self-testing, but as well, we started it from the ages of 18 upwards because we didn't want to give it to the really very young um, ones who maybe not understand how it's done and the results maybe because they needed to have to go back again to the facilities and do and retest. So now we, we, we taken it to, we used the pharmacies where we put the self-test in the pharmacy and then if people are in the pharmacy, they can just get it for free. We done our outreach activities as well with the self-test. Um, but I mean, again, we are not using them now. Yes, so it was just a study for us so that we see how many people are using it and if people are, happy to have it, then it's something that we're going to look at it and roll it out. But currently we're not doing it, but we've done it. So we're still in the phase of trying to finish up the study. Okay. Um, if Alice is there, please, um, it will be interesting to hear about other countries in the region. Otherwise we'll um, shoot a few more questions to Pumesa. Rike, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was having some internet troubles, so I just tried to no reconnect to something else. Um, sorry, could you repeat the questions? I may have missed them. Apologies. Yes, no problem. Um, it's related to the, the age for self-testing and assisted partner testing. Uh, so in, in Uganda, they are discussing whether the age should be 12 years as is the general HIV test or whether it should be higher up to 18 years for self-testing and um, they were wondering what the experience has been from other countries in the region. Okay I think there are a few more the problems. Oh, um, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, apologies. Um, I was just saying in terms of the evidence, there's no evidence on self-testing that has been published that includes those under the age of 16. So okay. all the studies include adolescents over the age of 16 for self-testing. Oh. Interesting. So there's definitely space for more research. Yep. There may be studies going on at the moment that haven't been published that include those under 16. Um, and I'm not aware of countries, but just to caveat that I, I don't have a huge finger on the pulse of all the um, ages of consent in terms of self-testing. I do in terms of overall HIV testing. Um, but I'm not, I don't know of countries that have gone kind of below 16, maybe others here. Am um, I able to comment on that? Okay, that is definitely um, an area that is noted for further research and investigation, very interesting. Um, so I'll take, we'll take one last question. However, there are quite a few remaining very interesting questions. So um, we will take them up with the presenters after this and post the answers online. But for now, we'll take the last question again, Pumesa. Uh, the question is from Regina da Silva related to the Community Youth Club. How do adolescents actually start attending the clubs? And what are the strategies um, for the adolescents to keep attending the clubs? Thank you for the question. So for us, they started um, attending the facility clubs before going to the community. So when we recruited them, we recruited them in a, in a facility club to a community club. So they had to attend um, a facility club for more than two years. And then that's when they graduated to be able to be in the community clubs. So I think for me, the strategy um, that I've used to keep them in the club, the sessions actually are one interesting part um, because the topics that we talk about, it's topics that are hitting them every day. 
And it's topics that are coming from them. It's not topics that we came up with. So we always sit with them and, and ask them what they want to talk about. So those excites them. They may, it, it makes them to want to come back um, so that they can talk about something else because we talk about things that they're unable to talk about at home. And remember the club, it's a space where um, they feel comfortable. They feel able to say whatever they want to say because they're all in the same group. So I think the other thing is the fact that we, the ages that we mix, we mix at age that we know that they understand their language that they speak. We don't um, mix the ones that won't understand what they, the others are talking about. So it's always good to mix um, the 15, 16 year old and 17 years in, in, in one group, and then the 18, 19, 20 in another group, then 20 to 25 in another group. Because we've seen that um, those that are less than 15 or 16, they still in school. And those that are over 20, they out of school. So now um, they, they talking different language. And I think the other part would be as well not mixing the vertically infected with the horizontally infected because as well the, the understanding is not the same. So we always make sure that um, they come in those different ranges and that ex really excites them. I don't know. In, inside the youth clinic, um, they always don't want to miss their club sessions, even though, yes, we do have those who want um, be coming to the clubs, but a lot of them, they don't want to miss out. So the friendly health service that the facility is delivering is also one part um, of, 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 of um, encouraging young people to come because they know that they have a dedicated nurse. So someone that when they come to the facility they will be speaking to, they also have a dedicated counselor or facilitator. So it's not like they just come to the facility or go to the community without knowing who to speak with. So the fact that there is that person that they can um, take charge of in, in the facility or in the community, it, it helps them a lot. And creating space again for them, if they want to call you, they want to SMS you or WhatsApp you, they want to ask you anything at any time, if you a person who's open to that, I think that also um, keeps them in care because they know that if they have questions, they do have someone to ask and that person will always be there for them. Thanks, Pumesa, for the comprehensive answer. I think it's um, a great note to close on with uh, creating space. So unfortunately, we've run out of time and we'll have to conclude the Q&A. Um, but as mentioned, we will be posting answers to these questions. If there are any other questions, please do type them in. We'll keep the chat box open for a little while more or send the questions to me and we will get back to you. Uh, also, we will post the PowerPoint as well as recording of the webinar on childrenage.org later today. Meanwhile, if you are interested in this topic and enjoyed the webinar today, uh, please tune in again tomorrow at the same time and the same place using the same link for day two of the PATA Summit, which is focusing on leaving nobody behind in the context of HIV and SRHR integration. So really focusing on those that are more marginalized and our blind spots in our response. So I'd like to thank again our three excellent speakers um, for this great webinar and the great presentations and have a great rest of the day to everyone else. Thank you for tuning in.